So thanks very much, Tom and um, Robert. Also, it's nice to see Robert. We go way back, and uh, it's nice to see him here. And I'm thrilled to be in Tokyo. I've never been to Tokyo before, and uh, glad to be at TUJ's. This is really sort of the crown jewel of TUJ's global program. So we're delighted to have a presence here, and um, so good, delighted to be here. And what I thought I'd do tonight is just put a couple of things on the table by way of setting the context for what's going on with respect to immigration reform in the United States now. And, um, and be brief so that you all can then take the conversation wherever you'd like to take it. So I'm just really going to do sort of a scene setter. Um, the title of the talk was this, this Strange Law and Politics of Immigration Reform in the United States. It really in some ways should be the strange politics and law of immigration reform because, uh, because it is an, an unusual uh, alignment um, of, of developments that we're now witnessing in the United States relating to immigration reform. So I'm going to do start off a little bit with the, with the strange politics of immigration reform. And, and you know, feel free if, if I'm not pitching things at the right level to, to jump in and ask questions even while I'm setting the scene here. So I'll speak a little bit about the politics and then a little bit about the particulars of the debate on immigration reform, about what the key sticking points are, and then uh, close with some thoughts about where we may be going in the future, especially if, as it looks this week, we're um, pointed towards failure in um, securing immigration reform. The key um, backdrop fact here is that there are an estimated 11 to 13 million undocumented aliens as we call them in the United States now. So 11 to 13 million individuals who are in the United States in violation of the law. And in theory, subject to removal from the United States as a result of that status. So this is an extremely large population of uh, individuals without status. So that's the um, a key uh, setup fact for, for what's being confronted now in the U.S. here. And then the key uh, political fact is the rise of the Hispanic vote. So in the United States, immigration is an issue that's dominated by the Hispanic immigrant community, and Mexico in particular. So a large proportion, the, va the vast majority, although not exclusively, but the, the, the large majority of the undocumented population is of Mexican nationality. And so this is an issue that is of great concern to the Hispanic community, including the Hispanic community that has citizenship. And that's a growing population in the United States. So in 2012, 10% of the electorate, 10% of the voting population was of Hispanic origin. And that was up by 25% since 2004. So this is a growing and increasingly powerful uh, voting block. And it was a voting block uh, that at one time, even in the very recent past, looked like it was up for grabs politically. So in 2004, the year that <coughs> President uh, George W. Bush was running for re-election against John Kerry, the Democrats carried the Hispanic vote but by only 8%. So the split was 56 to 44, Democrat to Republican. In 2012, that split was 71% Democrat, 71% voting for Obama, and 27% voting for Romney. So really a dramatic shift, a, really a break, a pivot towards the Democrats in the 
uh, Hispanic um, voting population. And so this is what gets, the 2012 election is what got immigration reform seriously on the table, or it's what has brought the Republicans to the table. There's a recognition now at the national level in the Republican Party that this is a problem going forward with respect to national elections. That to the extent that this population is growing uh, and to the extent that it's now breaking much more dramatically towards the Democrats, that this becomes yet another among many obstacles uh, on the road to the Republicans regaining control of the White House. And so, at, and, and the Hispanic, one reason, one reason that the Hispanic vote clearly broke in favor of the Democrats was a perception that the Democrats were uh, more progressive on immigration reform, with respect to, in particular, dealing with this substantial population of undocumented immigrants. Yep, you want to? Is, is that been substantiated, or is it still working on assumptions? That the Hispanic, that that was, yes, yeah, the, the polling, the polling, is, is, that this is a key issue for Hispanics. Can I ask just one other question? Yeah, sure. Have they, have they determined why it's a key issue for Hispanics? I guess what I don't understand is why why illegal immigrants would be so protective of, of illegal immigrants. Is there a connection? So it's a good question, and it's not all, it's not um, a sort of universal sentiment in the Hispanic population. And in fact, there's sort of a, a counter position among some Hispanic citizens that, well, we came in the legal way, they should too. But it, 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 it hasn't cut. And there was some thinking that, it would, that that would be a dominant position in the Hispanic community, but it hasn't proved to be the case. And I think there are two explanations. One is that there is uh, some sense of ethnic solidarity uh, in a macro sense here. And then there's also the presence of connections at the micro level, so that there are many Hispanic citizens who have undocumented relatives. And so it's an issue that's very close to home uh, for many Hispanic citizens, and that's why it is clear that Hispanics favor immigration reform, and there's a clear perception with some grounding in the politics that the Democrats were more progressive on immigration reform, and that was a key reason why uh, Hispanics broke uh, as uh, dramatically as they did for Obama. Although not, I mean, it's not overwhelming. It's not like the African American vote. Another voting bloc in the United States, the African American um, uh, voters, typically breaks more than 90 10 Democrat Republican. Here you've got 71, 27. And there are also the Hispanic, shouldn't, one shouldn't general, overgeneralize about the Hispanic community. There are lots of different component parts to the Hispanic community. One in particular that's um, much more conservative is the Cuban, Ameri Cuban American population that's based in Miami, which has broken strongly in favor of Republicans. But overall, uh, it's clear that Immigration reform is a key issue for Hispanics, that that was a key motivation for them to vote Democrat, and that's what got the Republicans to the table. So in the wake of the election, there was a, a clear change in the Republican rhetoric towards being much more receptive to dealing with the undocumented population in a realistic way understanding that this was not that Mitt Romney famously in the American context said, oh, these people can self-deport themselves. There's now recognition that even without immigration reform, some large percentage of this 11 to 13 million individuals is uh, going to stay put in the United States. So it's a, it's a persistent uh, issue. It's not going to go away. At the same time, also that there's clearly no realistic possibility of deporting all 11 to 13 million undocumented aliens. So this got the Republicans to the table, and so one might think 
well, the Republicans are going to play ball here. They've got a clear incentive with respect to national politics to agree to immigration reform, to agree to legalizing the status of some uh, substantial proportion of the undocumented population. Well, it's not turning out that way. So this is the sort of strange part of the, of the politics here. The way that the United States um, representation system of rep representation works is on a territorial basis. So representatives in the Senate and the House of Representatives uh, are voted on by a defined territory of individuals. And for Republicans, especially in the House of Representatives, at the level of the member districts, that is, of individual representatives, they don't have a clear incentive to come to the table on immigration reform. And that has to do with the way that the district lines are drawn in the US. And it works out that if you look at individual districts, so there are 435 congressional districts in the US, 234 of them are now held by Republicans. In 210 of the 234 <coughs> Republican held district, the Hispanic vote is less than 25% of the vote. And on average in Republican districts, less than 10% of the Hispanic population is represented in those districts as compared to the national average of 16%. And so if you're looking at this rationally from the perspective of an individual member of Congress, a Republican member of Congress, you don't care about the Hispanic vote because you don't have that many Hispanic voters in your district. And in fact, you may be, in terms of keeping your job, you may face a greater risk by appearing to be soft on immigration, on illegal immigration, to the extent that you're then vulnerable to a challenge by, more, by a more conservative Republican. So just a reminder, the way that uh, elections work in the US, you first have a so-called primary election to secure your party nomination, Republican or Democrat. And in recent years, moderate Republicans centrist Republicans have been losing in greater numbers to more conservative Republicans. And immigration is one of the flash point issues on which uh, an individual Republican legislator may make himself more vulnerable to the extent that, that he or she looks soft on illegal immigration. So, Especially in the House of Representatives, this is not so true in the Senate where you're representing broader constituencies at the state level. But in the House of Representatives, the politics cuts against immigration, against supporting immigration reform among Republicans, notwithstanding these very dramatic figures from the national presidential elections. And so what you end up with is really sort of a, cla uh, a classic collective action problem. It's why the, the national Republican leadership is coming to the table and trying, for the most part, to bring the rank and file, as they're known, the individual members on board for some kind of legalization program for the undocumented population. But it's the explanation for the, why the rank and file isn't following. So that it, just to give you uh, uh, thumbnail of where things now stand in the legislative process on immigration reform. A bill was passed out of the Senate in late June by a, by a good majority, 68 to 32, uh, with 14 Republicans among the majority. So short of overwhelming, but a strong majority coming out of the Senate supporting a program, and I'll speak to some of the details in a moment. Uh, so that, uh, so in the Senate, uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform uh, was uh, readily um, voted out on favorably. In the House, things are stuck now. 
and it looks like the Senate bill is a non-starter for um, purposes of a secu a securing approval of a bill in the House of Representatives. Um, and as of this week, things are looking pretty iffy by way of securing any um, uh, legislation out of the House. And so, so let, let, let me turn out, so that's sort of the political background and why things are a little bit counterintuitive with respect to the political incentives. Um, let me now turn to giving you some idea of, of what the sticking points are on the particulars of the comprehensive immigration reform package here and why, um, and why the Senate and the House uh, seem unable to agree why ultimately um, the, the whole effort may uh, go down in flames. So an important part of the background here is the last major uh, comprehensive immigration reform that involved a regularization of status for a large population of undocumented immigrants. And this was the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act. So almost 30 years ago now, during the Reagan administration, uh, enacted with strong bipartisan uh, support in a different era, in an era in which there was much more bi bipartisan legislating. That's certainly not the case today. Immigration reform, to the extent it has any chance at all, is really the exception uh, in um, today's Washington, which is otherwise characterized by serious uh, polarization and gridlock. Uh, but so the 1986 Immigration and Reform, Immigration Reform and Control Act involved the large scale legalization of two and a half million undocumented immigrants. At the same time that it also had an enforcement component. So the theory of the 1986 legislation was, okay, we'll accept the permanence of a large, although not nearly as large as the undocumented population that we're facing today, a large undocumented population, at the same time that we're going to clamp down on future illegal immigration. And the way the 1986 law did that was by adopting what are known as employer sanctions. So the theory is, not just the theory, it's also the fact that most undocumented immigrants, most illegal immigrants, are drawn to the United States by economic opportunities, by jobs. And so the theory of the 1986 law was, well, we can stem the tide of undocumented immigration if we close the door on jobs for undocumented immigrants. And the tool that was innovated in the 1986 legislation was to impose sanctions on employers who employ undocumented immigrants. Well, it didn't, it didn't work as planned, right? I mean, all you need is the fact that we're, uh, again, facing this even larger, by a factor of four, uh, population of undocumented immigrants. And there are all sorts of reasons why employer sanctions haven't worked, they're on the books, but they're very poorly, uh, they're very poorly enforced. And so on the, on the substantive side, one of the key arguments that Republican, that restrictionists, those who oppose immigration reform and legalizing the undocumented population is the lesson of 1986. And their sort of attitude, we have a saying in the US, uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, <laughs> right? So the, um, this is, it, uh, to say the least, a cautionary tale from the perspective of those who are concerned about undocumented immigrants. The concern being if, as in 1986, this population, this large population of illegal immigrants is regularized, is, is given legal status, well, 30 years down the road, we'll be facing an even bigger population of undocumented immigrants. You get a, 
the, the, the buzzword here or the what the restrictionists are trying to protect against is a cycle of amnesties, a building up, large buildups of undocumented immigrants, and then sort of uh, irresistible pressure to legalize the undocumented population. So that's that's the concern. And, you know, to, to to look at one one has to see both sides of these questions and their um, their respectable arguments on both sides of of this debate. You know, that's a, there's some justification for um, uh, for that concern if you're if if undocumented immigration is something that you're concerned about in the first place. So that's sort of the, is the, the legal backdrop. And that's why there's the su suspicion, this concern, uh, heightened concern the second time around for restrictionist forces in the Republican Party. And so uh, among really the key, the, really a, a central sticking point, a central point of contention between the rank and file Republicans in Congress and President Obama, who is supporting uh, some form of legalization, as well as uh, Senate Repu some uh, Senate uh, Republicans and the national Republican leadership. A key point here is: well, how do we how do we make sure that it's not going to happen again? And the, the way this is getting framed legislatively, or the way this disagreement is getting framed legislatively, is how you sequence the legalization versus the en enhanced enforcement. So the restrictionists want, you know, every, actually there's some consensus that there has to be enhanced border security, an enhanced immigration enforcement. That's in terms of the discourse of comprehensive immigration reform, everybody's on board with uh, enhanced border security and, um, and immigration enforcement. The question is how you do it. And the mainstream Democrat position here is We'll throw more. We'll we'll have parallel tracks. We'll start the legalization process. The, as it's in the in the discourse, this is the path to citizenship. Extending provisional legal status to undocumented immigrants who are here as of the end of 2011. Payment of fines, back taxes requirement that um, those seeking provisional that those seeking provisional status learn English that they earn citizenship so this is this is from the Democrat side path to citizenship earn citizenship nobody uses the word amnesty that's sort of a political non-starter you can't speak of amnesty for the undocumented population but on the Democrat side, that's a track that needs to start now. On the restrictionist side, the Republican side, the, especially the House Republican side, they want security first, enhanced enforcement first, and then legalization. So the key word in the, in the House Republican agenda here is trigger that you need to have border security and enforcement triggers before the legalization process starts. And that's a non-starter for um, the supporters of immigration reform. It's a non-starter for the White House and for congressional, um, for congressional Democrats on the theory that if you set these benchmarks, the way it would get legislatively articulated would be that border security has to reach a certain point, 90% effectiveness, before the legalization process can begin. And the fear, justified I think, 
on the Democrat side is the trigger will never be met, or if it is, it'll be too far down the road. Legalization process has to start now. So that's really, that's a, a major point of uh, contention. Otherwise, there seems to be some, at least rhetorical, agreement, although there's been some backsliding on the Republican side in recent weeks, that there should be a path to citizenship. It's a, for, for this uh, a large undocumented population. The question is, how long is it, and when does it begin? So that's really, that's the key to the core uh, area of disagreement. There are some wide areas of agreement. So on legal immigration, there's bipartisan support for uh, increasing legal immigration, uh, for particular kinds of immigrants, especially those in the high skilled, of a high skilled employ, uh, employment definition. So in 2012, a piece of standalone legislation called the STEM Act, which uh, uh, is an acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, that was enacted by the House of Representatives by a, a large majority and with substantial Republican support. Now, the reason it didn't go into law is because we're, Democrats want comprehensive reform. They don't want to do things piecemeal because, frankly, they've got leverage with respect to uh, some kinds of immigration that Republicans support, business-related immigration um, being um, the leading uh, example. So, so there, there's some uh, there's some areas where there's there's broad agreement, but on the core question of how to deal with the undocumented population, there's not. And as a result, there's a real uh, there's a strong chance that this is just going to collapse and fail. I think six months ago, there was uh, at least guarded optimism. That, um, that comprehensive immigration reform would be enacted by Congress. And I think that, uh, that the odds have gotten um, higher against it uh, succeeding. And so I'll just close my opening remarks um, with just one suggestion of a direction that things might go in if things failure, if things fail in Congress, and that is the possibility that the courts will start getting involved. So historically, the courts have largely stood on the sidelines when it comes to issues related to immigration. There's a constitutional law doctrine that goes under the title of plenary power doctrine, which is shorthand for the political branches have have plenary power over immigration. And the courts just don't have a role. There's no uh, role for judicial review, at least not with respect to uh, constitutional challenges of uh, political branch decision making in the area. And I, I wonder if that, that there might be a, a a pivot in the courts away from that very uh, historically entrenched uh, doctrine, which goes back uh, more than a century to the late late 19th century, that the courts have not really been active players in um, in supervising the political branches in the way that in the U.S. the courts are are depending on the issue and the area have exercised, at, at points, very robust supervision, constitutional supervision of the political branches. And I, and I think there's at least a possibility that, 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 that immigration law will be normalized in that way to the extent that a discourse of civil rights and of human rights gains some traction with respect to immigrants. 
So you're talking about 11 to 13 million individuals in the United States, some of whom have been in the United States for decades, many of whom have US citizen family members, often children, because under the US system of territorial birth rights citizenship, even if you're an undocumented alien, if you give birth to a child on the territory of the United States, the child has citizenship at birth. But that the, the, the upshot is these so-called mixed status families. Um, you have individuals who have been here for decades from a very young age and who are, for all social and cultural purposes, American. At the same time that their presence in the United States is in violation of law and in theory these individuals are subject to deportation. There's the, there's the potential here for this to be successfully framed in civil rights terms, in constitutional terms. And so if comprehensive immigration, there's this moment, there's this the appearance of this political window during which, notwithstanding gridlock in Washington on basically all other issues, there seemed to be some good prospect of progress in resolving an issue that pretty much everybody agrees has to be resolved in some way. If that window shuts and Congress proves itself to be incapable of addressing this question, then I think there's at least some chance that the courts will move in to sort of break the law again. But um, so that's where things stand. This is a huge, well, I'm not sure to what extent there's any reporting on this issue here in Japan, but this is a huge political issue now in the U.S., which looms very large, and so um, so it's an important it's an important issue in the U.S. political uh, 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 scene. And so I'd be happy to answer your questions on any of these sort of related um, issues. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Very thorough overview of the very complex issue. Um, so the floor is open to uh, questions. Let's speak up or do this whatever. So I promise Peter, this is a very dynamic group, so if you do not speak for too long, you know, it'll be good for questions. You seem like you have a question. No, we don't have a question. Okay. You have a question. Can you introduce yourself just because Peter doesn't know everybody yet? Um, my name is Kurt Sieber. I'm retired actually. And I'm uh, working on a book called Japanese Problems. And uh, my question refers to uh, the stamp bill, as you call it, I think. Mm -hmm. Because that is exactly what the Japanese government has in mind for Japan. Could you elaborate a little bit more on this stamp and why it failed and so on? Well, so what the, was the content of it? So in the US, the legal immigration system is it's a kind of quota system. They're allocations for different kinds of immigrants. So the largest, numerically by far, is so-called family-based immigrants. So those who are seeking to be united with close family members in the United States, spouses, um, children, uh, parents. Um, and then there's the so-called employment-based immigration, a system that hasn't, that's, um, that's been plagued by bureaucratic obstacles for purposes of securing permanent residence in the United States. So another part of the immigration scheme is between those who are coming to the United States for permanent residence, which translates in the, in the colloquial understanding to a green card, to getting your green card, this permanent resident, and then there are the so-called non-immigrants, which are for various other categories, including tourists, but also for, uh, in some cases, employer-based uh, immigration. The STEM um, legislation would have increased and established a new allocation for individuals with qualifications in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics areas. The idea being that, in the US at least, that we're falling behind. Right? The jobs are moving elsewhere because talent is elsewhere. 
and that we've created too many obstacles to skilled individuals moving to the United States. So the STEM legislation, and this would be a part of any comprehensive reform, looks to facilitate what everybody agrees is good immigration. The reason it failed is that it was introduced as standalone legislation. So the Democrats opposed it because the Democrats see a leverage point. This is something Republicans want. And so to the extent that the Democrats allow this to be enacted on its own, that reduces the chances that the Democrats will be on board with respect to undocumented immigration. I don't know if that's, if that's clear. Now, so part of the bargain, at the bargaining table, Democrats can say, now, well, we'll give you what you want on skilled legal immigration. You've got to give us what we want on legalizing the undocumented population. So it has to be a comprehensive rather than piecemeal. Maybe a link to this. Uh, obviously, you mentioned the, some in the business community wanted a STEM bill. Could mm -hmm. you kind of walk us through the various pressure groups. In other words, the business community, uh, ethnic-based groups, uh, religious groups, uh, regional interests, uh, various mm -hmm. business, agriculture, high tech, I mean, kind of who wants, who wants what? Right, so this is another, I mean, should I go and buy my congressman? Who's trying to, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, do, what are they trying to get so out? So this, this is another thing that makes the politics of immigration strange, and this has been true historically. And that is that you've got these interesting splits in both parties. So in the Republican Party, which is traditionally the party of business, corporate interests, corporations want cheaper labor, right? They, they think of immigration controls as pr protectionist, as raising costs of doing business. And so corporate interests have traditionally been uh, strong advocates of relaxed immigration controls. In fact, the Wall Street Journal's editorial page is probably as, as extreme a pro-immigration policy as any uh, editorial mouthpiece. They're basically open borders. So that's a pro-immigrant strain and powerful one within the Republican camp at the same time that you get the most intense anti-immigrant sentiment also in the Republican Party. The Tea Party, I don't know if that's a familiar political um, uh, movement uh, here in Japan. The, the Tea Party movement is part of the Republican Party, virulently anti-immigrant. Uh, on the Democrat side, you have ethnic um, uh, lobbies, immigrant advocates, generally pro-rights, individual rights, and so uh, strongly pro-immigrant, uh, an important strain of the Democrat Party. But then you also have the labor unions. Labor unions want to protect American jobs, at least historically they Labor unions see immigrant workers as, com as competition, as undermining their position. And so there's been this rust belt uh, element of the Democrat Party that's been very skeptical about, especially employer, low-skilled uh, immigrant, low-skilled immigration. Um, so you get these interesting uh, uh, alignments, although lately there's been a little bit more uh, polarization along party lines. Corporate interests on the Republican side uh, are wary about being too far out front on illegal, on, the, on issues relating to undocumented immigration. At the same time that labor unions are starting to go international and they actually see immigrants and even undocumented immigrants as a growth, as a growth population. And so there's been movement among the labor unions towards accepting uh, regularization of undocumented immigrants 
already in the U.S. and even increased levels of, um, of, uh, uh, of low-skilled immigration. At one point, actually, in some of these negotiations, there been a lot of negotiations among politicians. At one point, the politicians actually stepped aside on the question of agricultural workers and other low-skilled, a new visa category for low-skilled workers, and just let the Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO, the business interests, and the labor unions hammer out a deal on their own, basically, that was acceptable to both parties. The one other, in terms of the interest groups, and one other sort of interesting recent development, and this ties into the STEM Act um, uh, uh, discussion, and that is the tech, the tech firms have now ramped up their presence in Washington generally, but then particularly on immigration. So you get Microsoft, Google, the big tech uh, companies are going to bat. And not they're going to bat not just for the tech immigration, but really for comprehensive re reform. They tend to be more on the Democrat side, and they're, you know, they have substantial um, have to throw around uh, now in Washington in terms of money. Um, and so they're sort of new to the scene, new to the political scene on the, uh, 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 with respect to these immigration issues. So uh, my name is David Green. I'm from the Glow University. And I had uh, two questions for you, both kind of along the same idea, though. So one of them is uh, for current American work visas, for example, like the H-1B or similar categories, is there a path toward permanent residency on those? That's the first question. The second one is, um, I was wondering if you could go into more specific details about the uh, Senate bill. So from what I understand, they have bipartisan support, and then what entails the path toward citizenship, according to that bill. OK, so on the first question, the H-1B, is this is the favored, and this may get a little bit in the weeds, but there's something called an H-1B visa, which is a non-immigrant visa. It gets, uh, it can um, authorize an individual's work in the United States for up to six years. And it's the easiest path to getting in. Because it doesn't require, it doesn't require what's known as labor certification, which is a, is a, is a long bureaucratic process under which one certifies that you're not taking away any US job. So as the law now stands, the H-1B is a way for employers to get non-citizen employees into the country quickly. And once they're in the country, then they can start the green card process, the permanent residence process. So that's the typical sequence is H-1B, if you qualify for H-1B, and there are a lot of skilled professions um, uh, which um, or which individuals will qualify for H-1B visas, and then you get the green card thereafter. And that's, it's, it's, it's not an ideal way of doing things. I mean, the immigration law is this sort of encrusted, uh, it goes back to the 1960s, and then it's just been sort of built on in very irrational ways. So I teach immigration law, it's a big, thick statute, big law. It's like a tax law. And when I, when I start teaching my course in immigration law, I make sure to get the students to understand that I didn't write the law. Because otherwise, they'll blame me for it you know, at the end of the semester. I'm just the messenger. Because a lot of it makes no sense. It's just a patchwork of different visa categories and different um, ways of getting to permanent residence for the visa categories, H-1B is the section of the provision of the immigration law that deals with, it's the, it's the, it's the um, number that the statute under which one, uh, that designates this category of individuals. And they're all the way up to V. So there are visas from A to V. So what's that? 20, you know, 20 different classes of non-immigrant visas. And then there's subcategories. So there's 
H1A and H1B and H2A and H2B, and now they're proposing an H2C and a, v and a W visa. I mean, so they're, it's a mess. And it'd be great if they could just start from scratch, but nobody's, unfortunately, nobody's proposing that. So I think I lost your initial question there, but I think the idea is to get to, there's some skilled professions which won't qualify for H-1Bs, and so there's problem, there are problems there, and there are various problems with the H-1B program itself. For instance, if you're admitted as an H-1B holder, you can only work for the employer that sought your admission as an employee. You can't transfer your work authorization to a different employer, which, you know, which is a problem both from an individual's perspective and from a macroeconomic perspective. So the idea is to to facilitate this what everybody agrees is good is good immigration. Now the second question, I'm sorry. More just specific information about oh, the, 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 the yes. bill that was passed. Right. So the um, the way the Senate bill would work is that anybody Anyone who was present in the United States as of the end of 2011 and who does not have a criminal record and who can pay a $1,000 fine would be able to register for what is what would be known as provisional legal status. And the key to that provisional legal status is that it would give the individual work authorization. So the vast, the, the you know, so fairly recent, actually surprisingly recent cutoff date. So you only have to have been in the country for a year and a half. This would give this provisional status to the vast majority of this 11 to 13 million undocumented uh, alien population, and they could work, which is, from the individual's perspective, by far the most important. The green card, the work authorization has always been sort of the prize in the American immigration scheme, because that's why most individuals want to come to the U.S. is to work. Uh, so, uh, and especially among undocumented immigrants. So they would be given this provisional status. They would then have to wait 10 years for full permanent resident status. So they'd have provisional status first, during which period they can work. Would not be eligible for public benefits, though. This was part of the Senate deal. So they wouldn't be able to get um, health, uh, they wouldn't be ben beneficiaries under the new Health Care Reform Act. They would not be eligible for certain kinds of Social Security. And that's a status they would have for 10 years. And so at the 10 year mark, they would then be eligible for permanent resident status for green card, um, which gives you pretty much everything that you get with citizenship, although they would then have to wait another five years to naturalize as citizens. Green card holders get, the only things that you don't get as a permanent resident um, uh, relative to citizenship are you don't have the right to vote, uh, you, uh, and you don't have full locational security. You can, if you're a permanent resident alien and you engage in various kinds of criminal activity, you can then be deported. Whereas if you're a citizen, you're absolutely immune from deportation. But a lot of people live in the United States for decades as permanent residents and they live uh, lives that are, from a rights perspective, essentially um, identical to the lives of Citizens. And some from, especially from Western Europe, I'm not sure, sure about Japanese uh, immigrants to the U.S. or green card holders, uh, it's by choice that they don't acquire U.S. citizenship even, even when they're eligible for it. So, so it would be 10 years to green card status and then another five years, the path to citizenship would be 15, would be 15 years. Everybody. What about their employment rights as green card holders? Can they get federal employment? That's a, that's another. Can, you can, can they get state and local? What are the what? Which jobs are not eligible to green card holders? So federal civil service is not eligible to green card holders, and then some, although 
and increasingly few state public sector positions. So states can discriminate on the basis of citizenship with respect to certain public sector jobs. Uh, for the most part, states no longer sort of take advantage of that discrimination. So it used to be the case that to be a public school teacher in the United States, m most states required that you be a citizen. And now it's it's fewer it's few states that require. What about firefighters, police? Police officers that police so public um, uh, law so law enforcement is 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 one category which where citizenship is still. Made. So it's there's still some economic disadvantage, but it's not. so if you're interested in public service and public sector employment, then then in, in some cases you need to get naturalized. But that's really the only that and then the only other minor difference is that your advantage for purposes of securing uh, the admission of other family members if you're a citizen relative to um, if you're a green person. But this gap between the rights of citizens versus the rights of uh, permanent residents has been has been diminishing. It used to be the case long ago that as a non-citizen you couldn't own land and that you were restricted from a long list of, of professions. So there were actually some very interesting cases involving Japanese nationals on the west coast of the US and this was an unusual context in which the Supreme Court stepped in. There were so-called alien land laws under which non-citizens in California could not own real estate uh, and were barred from many professions including farming, fishing, so not, and not to mention things like being a lawyer or an accountant, uh, and the Supreme Court struck those laws down. So there used to be quite a large differential, and now it's really a limited, even when it comes to political rights, you can't vote as a permanent resident, but you can give money to uh, political candidates, and in most people's Perception giving money is the path to a lot more power than a single <laughs> than a single vote. So, so in a very real way, per permanent resident aliens, non citizens, are politically empowered, and you can even say that about undocumented. So, they one part of this civil rights narrative. There were in um, 2010, there were some uh, mass, there were some quite large demonstrations marches uh, by uh, undocumented immigrants. And that's something that had some, uh, that captured the um, political imagination, notwithstanding the fact that obviously undocumented immigrants don't themselves have the vote and they can't give to um, political campaigns. Although an interesting part of the union story is there's one union in particular, the Service International Employees Union, SIEU, which represents uh, professions in which there are large numbers of undocumented aliens. And the SIEU has been very vigorously advocating undocumented immigrant rights politically. And so you can say that undocumented immigrants even have this political voice. And uh, Robert asked, about religious uh, constituencies and how they play out. Interesting shift that's starting to happen here where some uh, religious groups, evangelical religious groups, are starting to shift to the pro-reform side of the aisle. And this is really out of self-interest that undocumented Im immigrant and undocumented immigrant uh, populations are a growth area for um, for certain religious denominations, Protestants, evangelical uh, uh, in the South, actually, especially. It's a very interesting um, development. So on that side, to the extent that you get more of a shift like that, you know, maybe that tips the balance. Um, maybe that's the kind of thing that could um, that could tip the balance.
I'm Barbara Torrell. I'm an American, but I've been out of the country for many years, but I try to follow what's going on. And you began your talk uh, by saying that the Republicans, they're concerned about the Latino vote, and that's what's really gotten them involved. Um, my question is, you didn't talk that much about the white laborer and the Republican interest in the white laborer. And I would think then the whole question of wages and having to pay for undocumented workers in education and their children and so forth and so on. So I wonder if you would allude to that and how the white laborer feels about the Democratic Party supporting immigrant wages. You, you follow, uh, yeah, so that's what that's so that's been part of the split in the Democrat Party, where you've got this restrictionist constituency. You know, frankly, that sort of white labor in the traditional paradigm is a is some ways a dwindling population. Although you still see, um, yeah, you know, that this is what generates the very intense anti-immigrant sentiment that one finds in in some uh, constituencies. It's not just economically defined, it's a, it's a, reg a, a regional, interesting re regional development is uh, it's, um, it's states in which there, there was little history of immigration, in which there's been an explosion in the undocumented uh, immigrant population where you've got the most intense opposition to immigration. So in the South, in Georgia, North Carolina, and then Arizona, Alabama, these are states in which there's been this real backlash. And it's just not just about economics, it's about sort of difference. And whereas places like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles that have a history of immigration, are sort of used to it. But it's not challenging sort of a worldview in the way that if you live in a smaller Georgia town, all of a sudden there are all these people around you that don't speak English and that have different customs. And there's more of a sort of feeling of threat there. It's more of a front lines thing. And one, so one, uh, another sort of interesting moving part in this picture is in the, uh, in the face of the failure to enact immigration reform, some states and localities have tried to pass their own uh, immigration reform, mostly in the form of anti-immigrant um, uh, So Arizona, right? This was the SB 1070, the SB 1070 law, uh, sort of take matters into their own hands. Now the Supreme Court struck down the important parts of that law. And so for the moment, at least, that's off the table, at least as unilaterally undertaken by state and local governments. Still, there's a possibility that one sort of you know, point of possible compromise to bring the Republicans back on board here would be to agree to approving. If So the Supreme Court said, State and local governments can't act on their own. In the absence of uh, legislative approval from Washington. But Congress could decide to approve measures like SB 1070. And then they would, then they'd be okay. Then they'd be constitutional. And some of the uh, Republican proposals in the House in particular would expressly approve of state and local governments enforcing immigration laws on their own. And part of the, you know, another part of the strangeness of this is you've got these laws on the books that are, for the most part are just not enforced. Right? I mean, obviously they're not enforced to the extent that you've got this 11 to 13 million individuals who are in the United States in violation of the law. And that so, and there, you know, there are many stories of people, again, especially in these anti-immigrant areas, where a, a local law enforcement will pull somebody over at a traffic stop and check the person's immigration status. 
and have a reasonable suspicion that the person is in the United States in violation of the law, and they'll call up the Federal Immigration Enforcement Office, the ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And the people at ICE will say, thanks, sorry, we've got other things on our hands now. And this kind of, this really sticks in the craw of the anti-immigrant constituency. So there are these laws on the books, they're not enforced even when somebody's identified as being undocumented as an undocumented immigrant. And so the state, what the state and local governments would like to do in these, in these restrictionist um, areas is enforce it on their own, basically. You know, have lo local cops, state cops, take the federal law that's not being enforced and then enforce it in their in their own jurisdiction. And there's some interesting possibilities there. I mean that would be an interesting that could the, the Democrats, the White House is opposed at the moment is totally opposed to those proposals. I actually think, and this is an area where I've done a lot of that I've done a lot of work, that, that if it gets to an otherwise acceptable um, package, that that's actually an area where there should be some give. Because what happens is that, OK, Arizona says that they don't like immigrants. They're going to enforce against undocumented immigration. That's not good for business in Arizona. That's not good for Arizona's image internationally. That's not good for tourism. It's not good for convention business, which is really important in a place like Arizona. And so I think even if the states were given a longer leash, were allowed to engage in this kind of immigration enforcement on their own, that it would end up being self-correcting. Because it just, they'd end up seeing the cost of immigration enforcement in various ways. And there was actually an interesting dynamic that was already playing out with respect to SB 1070, the Arizona law, before the Supreme Court sort of shut it down. That Arizona was, it was clear that it was losing money because it had passed, uh, you know, Mexico, uh, the Mexican Foreign Ministry uh, adopted a travel advisory for travel to Arizona. You know, that's, <laughs> there are a lot of Mexican, Mexicans who have a lot of money that, they spend in Arizona, and if all of a sudden border communities and other places are losing that, that's they're going to be businesses that hurt. And then those businesses go to the state house and say, "This is killing us. You know, you gotta, you gotta roll it back. Or you gotta make it go away." They'll do that usually behind closed doors. But so that actually, I think, is in the end, even if you gave state and local jurisdictions some room to enforce immigration laws on their own, then in the long run it wouldn't actually they wouldn't actually do a lot of enforcing. Yeah? Follow up with some you, you you mentioned the fact that obviously there are politics involved. To look at it from a point of view of what's going to help me politically, Dr. Holly's first, second and third question any successful mm -hmm. politician has to ask himself. When you look at it from the point of view of the Democratic Party, isn't it better for immigration reform to fail? Because after all, okay, the plus side, the theory is when these people get citizenship, they're more likely to vote Democrats because they beat. Yes, the it's The fact it's is, is yeah. it's going to take at least them 16 years to become US mm -hmm. citizens. Not all of them will do it, you know, for a variety of reasons. Any of their children already American, so the they kind of net gain in terms yeah, of voters, A, is a long time down the road and isn't that great compared to the entire mm -hmm. voting population. On the other hand, if I can port, and if immigration reform doesn't pass, these people aren't going to get deported. I mean, that's obvious in the long run. They're here to stay. I mean, yeah. On the other hand, I basically paint my opponents as being anti-Hispanic, which is not necessarily the case, but as I can portray it, yeah. I can imply that they're anti-immigrants. That's not bad because they're, growing, they're also non-Hispanic immigrants, Asians, or whatever. They're yeah. not really part of the undocumented group at all. But if you can say, basically, the Republicans look, don't like people who are not of European ancestry, 
kind of the mm -hmm. background. That's perhaps better, you know, especially with a few nasty cases, you know, some Arizona sheriff shooting a guy because mm -hmm. he looks alien or whatever. So how, how does this play in Washington? Yeah, so it's, it's politics versus principle. And again, I think that's where the civil rights narrative may um, be made bare on this. To the extent that it, it's so you're absolutely right that in and some I'm ways, a in some ways, story, to be honest, it's like a win. It's a win-win. Yeah, it's a win-win proposition for the Democrats yeah. that that they 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 win if they get comprehensive immigration reform. There's this new pool. I mean, this is another disincentive that the Republicans have to the extent that they regularize this population of 11 to 13 million undocumented aliens, you know, and the law, the, these are more likely to be Democrat voters than Republicans. That's one reason, actually, there's a fight over how long the path to citizenship is. Depends on your discount rate, basically, um, your political discount rate. Depends how old you are as a politician. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, um, so, but, uh, but, um, but to the extent that it starts to be framed as a, as a civil rights matter, then I think the politics starts to look a little cheap, really. And that it, it becomes, it's, it, it elevates it to something that's a matter not, it's not, it's not merely politics. And so you're, you're right that these 11 to 13 million people, they're not going anywhere for the most part. Um, but you know, but they 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 have a clear second class status, and there is something about this that should, and I think again that it's coming on to sort of into the public consciousness in a new way, in a sort of rights through a right. It's being considered through a rights optic now. That these are people who are they're not second class citizenship. This is something that if you want to if you want to tar any proposal as being bad in the US, you say it's going to result in second class citizenship. And here, you know, clearly second class and not even citizens uh, as undocumented immigrants. And so I think, and, 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 then, and then finally, even as a matter of politics, the Hispanic community is, they're putting the administration's feet to the fire, the Democratic Party's feet to the fire in this in terms of, there was a lot of unhappiness in the first um, Obama administration that he hadn't pushed hard enough on immigration reform. And there is the turnout factor, right? So even if Hispanic voters are cutting heavily for Democrats, a key part of the picture is how many of them actually turn out to vote. And on average, Hispanic voters are less likely to vote than other voters, and sort of the extent that Democrats are perceived to be going slow on immigration reform, then they're not going to get as big a bump out of the Hispanic um, electorate as they as they would if they sort of go whole hog. Although another yet another part of the, the the odd politics these days is there's an understanding even in the Hispanic uh, political leadership that Obama himself shouldn't be too far out front on immigration reform at this moment because House Republicans and, and sort of core Republican voters hate Obama so much that to the extent he's more closely identified with immigration reform, it actually would, if he's too far, if he's too aggressive in pushing for immigration reform, <laughs> then that actually might lower the chances of it getting through the House of Representatives because the animosity to the White House is, 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 is so great this, at this point across the board. Yeah. Yep. Um, to follow on from what Rob was suggesting about you know, cynicism in Washington, D.C., I mean, one, one view looking at this is this is really a problem created in D.C. by you know, minimum wage laws and things like that. And and the, the situation as it is benefits too many people. You've got 11 odd million people who have no right to vote, who are quiescent workers. Corporations are happy that the government's not enforcing the law because you've got, you know, people who are working much lower than, you know, minimum wage. Um, and the, the situation always, it, there's a, another aspect to this to me is the, the situation is a whipsaw always in favor of more federal power 
the more, especially after, after September 11, I think you can see maybe some aspect of this is increasing you know, militarization and, you know, of the borders and even within the U.S. We've got the TSA and now there's some, you know, not a, a number of people to talk about, you know, the security checkpoints within 100 miles from the border. Every citizen has got to declare his citizenship or, you know, or if they refuse, you know, they're, they're stuck there until they can demonstrate that they're citizens. Um, and one aspect that I read about in the, in the, the bill approved by the uh, the Senate was, you know, it's something slipped in to require, you know, not, un, you know, tamper-resistant, you know, national ID cards. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent can you address this kind of mil this kind of increasing, you know, federalization of of power? Well, so the, so immigration law has always been considered to be a federal power, so that's a pretty. Um, it used to be the borders were, of course, you know, we're in the nation of immigrants. Uh, right. So, the, so there actually were no, there were no federal immigration laws until the 1880s. The first federal immigration laws were enacted in the, and weren't enacted until the 1880s, before which it was over force. But it's always been considered a matter of federal control. Now, but now that said, border security has been ramped up in a major way, both in the face of increased undocumented immigration and in the wake of 9-11, although to some extent they're at cross purposes. So one reason that there's less ordinary immigration enforcement is that there are more resources devoted to counter-terror aspects of immigration, which are actually tiny in terms of numbers, you know, uh, tiny numbers. So there are resources that were moved from Ordinary immigration enforcement to counter uh, counter terror enforcement. Um, the border security again. I'm not sure this is a question of federal power versus state power, but uh, and one really almost somewhat bizarre aspect of the Senate bill, which was passed the bill passed by the Senate, was that as part of the deal to get more Republicans on board. The Senate bill just throws money at border security. I mean, almost literally, uh, it would double. So the the, I mean, the the borders are patrolled by uh, the, the, what's known as the Border Patrol, and the Senate bill would double the size of the Border Patrol from twenty thousand to over almost I think almost fifty thousand in the course of 10 years, an extra $50 billion to border enforcement. And then there's this fence building pro uh, project. So there are already 350 miles of fence built along the southern border. The Senate bill would add another 350 miles. Now, that's just, that's just, border, that's just border security theater. I mean, it's just, it's for the appearance of immigration enforcement that that's undertaken. Nobody, nobody in the Border Patrol, they were stunned when the Senate bill went through because they, they, they won't know what to do with, with, the, with the doubling of the uh, Border Patrol. And the fence, at some level, is just, it's a cartoon. It's, again, it's, it's this appearance of doing something. And then for the restrictionist constituencies, for the anti-immigrant constituencies, this plays pretty well. Building this big high fence, mm -hmm. you know, that looks like there, it's something concrete, literally concrete, that um, is being done about illegal immigration at the same time that, that all um, reputable uh, studies of this subject show that Border fencing is completely ineffective against illegal immigration. It just moves it. It just moves it down the line. So when you had a border fence built uh, at the San Diego, Tijuana, California, Mexico line, you just moved the illegal immigration into uh, into the desert in Arizona, which, by the way, results in a non-trivial number of deaths. Of people who were, end up stuck in the desert, 
it, it really, it, and it's certainly not cost effective. Another uh, key figure on this question of undocumented immigration is that, of course, in the, in the popular understanding of undocumented immigration, it's people who come across the Mexican. If Mexicans who come across the southern border, illegal. Estimates of 40% uh, or so of undocumented immigrants entered the United States illegally and then violated the terms of their non-immigrant admission. So they had permission to enter the United States as tourists or as uh, temporary workers or as students. Student, actually, student visas, traditional source of undocumented immigration, come in as a, on a student visa and then you just stay. And obviously, border fence isn't going to do anything to stop that population of, of uh, undocumented immigrants. So it's, at some level, it's not just strange, it's sort of silly. But if that's what it takes to get extra Republican votes, if that's what it takes to get a deal, then they'll just throw a bunch of money at it and create, it becomes, it basically becomes another sort of federal government jobs program. In the same way that TSA, TSA is the, uh, the, the airport inspector, the security inspector, which I think is now the largest single source of federal government employment outside of the military. So that's the kind of, you know, again, but if that's what it takes, that's what they'll do. Well, I would suggest it's not just what it takes and what they do. It's, that's, that's the basic dynamic of these interventions is they create problems that require more interventions and more government expenditure. But in this case, actually, they could solve the problem but through less intervention by That's just, right. Yeah. So they're yeah. not interested in actually solving the problem. Right. That's, well, that may be, yeah. I was, I was just going to say one thing that I was thinking about that hasn't been really mentioned too much here. I think we're looking a lot of the e legal uh, you know, aspects of this, and that's, I understand that. But I, I do think that there is a certain level of xenophobia and racism that comes along with opposition to greater immigration. Because you don't hear people talking about um, opposition to immigrants from Poland or Bulgaria or anything like that, um, they're white. Um, but just before I was looking at something that I was remembering, um, before the election, um, famous uh, American pundit Bill O'Reilly was saying that before the uh, this last election that, um, that if Barack Obama won, it was because the demographics of the country had uh, changed. The white establishment is now a minority. Um, and um, I'm to look at it's not a traditional America anymore. And how much do you think that actually plays into the dynamic of opposition to immigration and it being seen as, especially illegal immigrants, as mostly being, you know, um, brown people from, you know, uh, Latin America and sort of that xenophobic racist component? To it? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, everybody's pretty careful in terms of how they express opposition to immigration, at least at the national level they are, but um, it's pretty clear that immigration is, that, that the Mexic the Mexico's um, overrepresentation among undocumented immigrants is, is a clear, an important part of, of the picture. Um, at, this, at the same time that it's it's tricky to sort of isolate it because, again, everybody's pretty careful not to express it in those terms. But it's a clear driver that it would be, I think, a completely different story if if the range of undocumented, if the if there were a greater range uh, in terms of nationalities among undocumented immigrants, and you didn't have one nationality that does have a racial identification. Um, that's certainly associated with the popular mind. And actually, one sort of control for this, another area that I do a lot of my work in is in citizenship. Uh, citizenship law, and I do actually a lot of work in particular on dual citizenship. And that was an area where I, I would have thought that there would be a lot of opposition in the United States to dual citizenship. And especially after Mexico changed its law to um, allow for dual citizenship between Mexico and the United States. And there actually hasn't been that much uh, op uh, opposition or any serious moves 
against dual citizenship in Congress. And my thinking on that is that the range of types of dual nationals is much broader. Uh, I mean, it's so that you have a lot of Italians, Americans that have dual citizenship, or Irish and Americans that have dual citizenship, Israeli and Americans that have dual citizenship with another country, powerful constituencies that don't fit into this sort of immigration narrative of it all being about stuff, you know, people coming from south of the border. And, um, and so maybe that, that's sort of a, a reference point by way of basically validating what you said. So. I, mean, I realize this question is going to seem somewhat heretical to anyone from the border states, uh, the Mexico border states, but, uh, and, and probably at the national level as well. But uh, as I thought about this, your comment about dual citizenship is what, what sparked it, because I've been thinking about it separately. But has there been any thought or any serious consideration of, of going the opposite direction? and opening the borders with Mexico. Because the, and the reason I say that is because I think, uh, I think initially, obviously Arizona, California, Texas would be afraid of what would happen, a lot of undocumented workers coming into the US, I realize that. But there also could be the opposite, going back the other way as a countermeasure. Um, there's a lot of opportunity in Mexico for Americans, and it's, it's a huge market. There's also land there that's cheaper. and. Uh, Ultimately, it might result in, in less less conflict, but I realize it's a, it's a tough thing to take. Yeah. So, so two things about that. I mean, um, what is this one sort of um, unintended consequence of increased border security? Is that once an undocumented immigrant enters the United States, he's more likely to stay because because it's tougher to get in. It used to be the case. It's before the mid-1990s that there basically was a lot of circular illegal immigration. The illegal immigrant comes to the United States, works, goes home for Christmas. That's what we and actually had in my home state. We had yeah. agricultural workers come in, yeah. work through the summer, go back yeah. home for the hop. For the some of them were legal. But some of them were legal because there is actually a, at least a small, but I'm sure a lot of them probably were not. And there was basically no enforcement at the border. And so when the jobs and then even on a seasonal basis, dry it up, they go home. Now you come in and because the, basically the cost of entering the country illegally has gone up. And the risks. And the risks have gone up. That once you're in, you're just more likely to stay. So there's less of that. That's an unintended consequence, obviously, that doesn't serve the restrictionist um, cause. Um, so, uh, and then your point about Increasing opportunity in Mexico. Well, that ultimate, you know, that's the everybody's optimal endpoint is that you have less of an economic imbalance between the two countries, so that there's less pressure, there's less economic incentive to travel to the United States. As for open borders, no. I mean, we're not anywhere close. Um, you know, you've got some philosophers who make the open borders argument, which I think is actually quite difficult to rebut. Um, and then you've got economists, you've got uh, libertarians, the, the Cato Institute, for those of you who know the think tank array in Washington, the Cato Institute, which is libertarian and largely Republican in its identity, is totally open borders. This is just another form of protectionism. But it, it, it's nowhere close to the sort of political mainstream at this point. So open borders is the uh, Question yeah, yeah. Um, just real quick, um, just have a question about kind of the correlation between the, the Voting Rights Act being struck down yeah. in the Supreme Court, and what kind of effect do you think it's going to have on immigration uh, reform? I mean, it seems kind of timed quite well, I think, <laughs> to be in. So the Voting Rights Act is why you've got this, this, these districting anomalies. It's an it's a important part of the story as to why individual members, Republican members of the House of Representatives, don't have to care about the Hispanic vote because the districts have been drawn in such a way as to make for so-called majority minority districts. So you try to get all the Hispanic voters, and it's more typically applied with respect to African American, the black uh, voters, so that they have secure districts in which they're a majority. 
But what's happened is, and this is important to the sort of whole political, the story of political polarization in Washington is that, is that the districts themselves have been polarized. Now the Supreme Court's recent decision, which makes it more difficult to enforce the Voting Rights Act, I'm not sure that that's got any clear, at least immediate, uh, implications for uh, for immigration reform. It's going to make it more difficult. I, I just don't. It may make it more difficult to establish majority minority districts for Hispanic voters in areas of the country where the Hispanic population is growing. But I'm not sure that it's got a clear implications for for immigration. I'm curious where the agricultural section and, and lobby falls on this issue, given their, uh, that they rely on cheap labor harvest time so much, but also uh, under comprehensive immigration reform, potentially um, legal workers can now make legal wages. So I can't. Um, I mean, it's clear that, that I, you know, it's um, I, I think there's there's conflicting evidence with respect to sort of what what wages are paid to um, the undocumented population, to what extent uh, sub minimum wage is the norm in the, in the agricultural sector. So I'm not sure, and I think certainty is probably more important, and so I, I think that the agricultural the, um, sector would prefer to have regularization here and a, supply, a reliable supply of labor even if it means that uh, wage um, and labor laws, which by the way do apply to undocumented immigrants, um, uh, even if they are sort of more readily Enforced. So I think they pretty clearly, and there are these stories of in some of these states that have enacted their own laws of undocumented aliens sort of leaving town and leaving in Alabama. Yeah, in Alabama, especially with leaving the the fruit to rot on the the vine. So I think I, I think the agricultural sector does have an interest in in certainty, and so um, so they'd like to have a reliable supply. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for making this possible.